Our base case is no disruption. It's mutually assured destruction. It's not in the interest of any party um, to stop flows of energy through Ukraine. Employment is still well below the pre-pandemic trend, but everything else about the labor market says it's very tight. We have no intention of putting American forces or NATO forces in Ukraine. But uh, we are, you know, as I said, there are going to be serious economic consequences if he moves. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome, beautiful Rome. Here's what's coming up on today's program. We focus, of course, on Fed. It's the big Fed day. Stocks climb ahead of today's meeting. Jay Powell will almost certainly signal a March hike. The question is, how big? Raising the stakes. President Biden weighs personal sanctions against Vladimir Putin if Russia invades Ukraine. Germany seeks an exemption for energy. And of course, we're live here in Italy. You can see it behind me. It's a Campidoglio. We're in Rome, and the second day of voting gives no winner in the presidential election. The Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, remains the lead candidate. I'm live in Rome this hour also to talk about Ukraine and the relationship with Chief Executive and Vladimir Putin. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. Joining us is our Danny Berger. Danny, all eyes on the Fed. Exactly. And despite what you'd usually expect for market day like this, where you'd wait for the Fed, perhaps not make a lot of moves, it is a perhaps surprisingly bullish day here in Europe. The Euro stock 60 up more than one and a half percent. Volumes are very strong as well. They're easily above the average volume for the past 40, 30 days, rather. So some conviction behind those moves as well. Perhaps it's somewhat earnings fueled. We did see earnings yesterday from, of course, one of the big fang stocks, Microsoft. And that lift Lifting post-market session, we're seeing Nasdaq futures up 1.4 percent. Meanwhile, we are seeing some dollar strengthening heading into the decision today. I was talking to James Lord of Morgan Stanley earlier this morning, who said that the the top is in in the dollar. That bullishness is fully played out. Still, we are seeing more buying when it comes to the dollar versus the euro, and your 10-year yield up by one basis point. Now, heading into this Fed decision, there is some hope that perhaps we'll have a logical response to the Fed. That's because a lot of positioning has been wiped out. It's been a clean slate when it comes to bond positioning. This is JP Morgan client positioning on the 10 year yield and we, on the 10 year rather. And we've seen that the shorts that have stacked up over the past month or so have started to come off. I, again, the idea here is we've had a bit of a cleansing in this market. So we are back to neutral heading into the Fed decision and therefore can react appropriately to what they say. It's not just in bonds. I should say we've seen something similar in equities. According to Deutsche Bank, we've seen positioning move to underweight in equities for the first time since we emerged out of this post-pandemic hole. So neutral on bonds, neutral on equities, which means, Francine, we have a very interesting setup into today's decision. Yeah, we certainly do. I can't wait, actually, for FOMC. Now, let's talk a lot more about the market. Sandy, thank you so much as ever. Danny Berger there in London. We're joined by Thomas Kosterg. He's senior U.S. economist at Pictet Wealth Management. Thomas, a million questions, of course, about, you know, positioning ahead of FOMC, but also the fact, good morning, that the market is very focused on interest rate increases. It seems to me the most interesting is maybe quantitative tightening. Are we underestimating the fact that we could have a surprise of how much the Fed will continue bond purchases? Right. So the, the main uh, conclusion today should be a signal that they intend to hike rates in March uh, by, you know, most likely by 25 basis points. But the persistence of inflation and also the, the, the really the strength in wage growth uh, does put a risk of, uh, of a 50 basis points rate hike uh, potentially later this year, even though I still believe yeah. that the Fed will be very gradual in its uh, rate hikes. And I would still expect a pace of one rate hike per uh, quarter. Uh, but the risk is that they do more than that, given a wage growth and also uh, the inflationary pressures, including due to Omicron. Yeah, and Thomas, this is one of the most important things, right, is the fact that actually the market seems to be fairly certain that it's a 25 basis point increases each time the Fed hikes. I mean, does the composition of actually and the gradual increase, we could have 10 basis points and then a 50 basis points, does it matter or is it more the end game of where rates are by the end of 2022? 
what matters as well is the balance sheet, right? Because we know that uh, if they announce a balance sheet runoff, that's also equivalent to additional rate hikes. So if they do 25 basis points per quarter on the rate hike side, but also on top of that, if they do the balance sheet runoff, uh, that's additional uh, tightening. So, you know, we should take that into account as, as well. I mean, it's a pretty aggressive uh, pace if they do both at the same time. And by the way, that would be quite new to do both at the same time, because last time around, uh, when they were announcing, uh, uh, you know, the things on the balance sheet, they would pause on the rate hikes. But this time around, uh, they seem to go uh, on both ways at the same time, announcing a balance sheet runoff and some rate hikes. Mm -hmm. Um, Thomas, give me a sense of actually what the biggest policy mistake right now would look like. We had a good conversation with Philip Hildebrand, and he says, look, central banks just have to be much clearer in explaining why we have this higher inflation. I know we talk a lot about, you know, if the Fed hikes too soon or too aggressively, then it would, you know, possibly bring us into a recession. But if they wait too long, then we have, you know, in inflation that's entrenched. But how much, percentage-wise, is this inflation in the U.S. due to supply chain concerns, even because of Omicron? Well, I think part of the hawkish uh, pivot from the Fed comes from two things. First of all, they realize that the labor market is actually very tight. We're close to full employment. Uh, that's quite new. So they believe that the participation rate uh, will, uh, will not bounce due to structural reasons. And point number two is that they also believe that inflation is mostly driven by uh, supply chain issues, but also driven by strong consumer demand. And, uh, you know, by tightening policy, they would also like to deflate a bit this very strong uh, consumer uh, demand. And I think that's quite the, the, the new thing here. And the question today is to what degree do they want to go in deflating consumer demand and how do they want to achieve that? Do they want to target the wealth effect through stocks and house prices to deflate consumer demand or not? I think that will be the quick question. Yeah, very good questions. Do you think we'll have more answers on that today? Has the Fed been pretty clear in its communication to the markets? Right. I mean, it would be good to see whether they believe, you know, that inflation is mostly a supply chain uh, issue or whether consumer demand plays a role or not. I think the Fed has not been so clear about that. So it would be good to have more, more answers. And point number two is obviously we would like to know the Fed's view on, uh, on the stock market and stock market valuations and the role it plays into the wealth effect and the role the wealth effect plays into boosting consumer demand and potentially leading to inflationary pressures down the line. So I think we, we still have a lot of questions uh, that we, we want to know more about, yeah. Yeah, we certainly do. Thomas, thank you. Thomas Coster, they're helping us trying to ask some of the important questions that we hope we'll have answers to from the Fed. Senior U.S. economist at Pictet Wealth Management. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more from Italy. Beautiful Italy. We're fully caffeinated, fully hydrated, ready to tackle another day of voting. Italy's lawmakers go to the ballot once again after failing to elect a new president for the second day in a row. But we also talk about the Fed. We talk about inflationary pressures and, of course, the role that Italy has in dealing with Putin. There's that call between chief executives and Vladimir Putin, Italian chief executives, the government saying this is not a great idea, but actually Kremlin confirming it will go ahead. We'll talk about all of that shortly. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Rome, beautiful Rome. Now, the focus here, of course, is on the presidential election, but it's also on Ukraine. Now, Italian lawmakers have failed in another round of voting to elect a new president. Now, there's already been two votes, Monday and Tuesday, and then they both failed, of course, to agree on a consensus candidate. Uh, today, there's another vote, and if that doesn't prove conclusive, there will be another one tomorrow as well. Now, at the same time, we watch, of course, Italy's relationship with Russia.
And the Italian government has asked companies not to hold a call, conference call, with Vladimir Putin that was scheduled for today, though just this morning the Kremlin said that the meeting would be taking place. It has Rome buzzing. Now we're joined by Fabrizio Pagani. He's former chief of staff of the Italian minister of economy, or, well, finance and economy minister, Piercarlo Padoan. He is also global head of economics and capital market research at strategy at Musenig. So he understands the inner workings of government, but he's also an economist. He's also the founder of m and It's not the <laughs> chocolate things. It's a, a great association, actually, you know, trying to influence policy in Italy. Um, thank you, Fabrizio, for coming on. Look, there's a number thank of things you. that are extremely complicated to unpick, especially maybe for international investors, which is the relationship, the longstanding relationship that Italy has with Russia. And uh, Europe is dependent on Russian gas. At the same time, there's maybe a strong political message that needs to be sent to, to Ukraine. So economically, how do they do that? Well, it, it's indeed a very peculiar moment and a very complicated moment, given also that the, you know, the government, the parties in Italy are very much focusing in, 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 in this very moment on the, on the, on the election of the, of the President of the Republic, which, which is one of those um, institutional challenge and opportunities which the, 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 the Italian constitutional framework uh, uh, has. Um, the, the relationship with Russia is very strong. Italian export to Russia and Italian uh, uh, import from Russia, particularly, particularly gas. Um, Italy is dependent uh, on, uh, for, for, ga for gas supply, not only from Russia, because we have also other, other uh, um, suppliers, and uh, there are also there is also a good energy mix in, yeah. in, 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 in the country. However, there is you know it cannot be denied that the Russian gas plays a very important uh, uh, role. And Italy is a very manufacturing country, right. so it's energy thirsty. And we have seen that the, 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 the raise of, of gas prices is, is taking a toll on the, on the Italian uh, uh, manufacturing. Um, if, you, if you talk to entre entrepreneurs nowadays, the major preoccupation is indeed commodity prices and energy prices. They have a full order books for 2022. They are not concerned about, about, about demand. They had a great 2021 big export record on export for Italy last year. But this year, the, the, the question is big revenues, but, but smaller margins. And I, I know you're an economist and on a political analyst, but so what's the right way for the government to deal with this, right? This is, you know, complicated because you need lower energy prices, but you also need to, I guess, support your allies in dealing with Russia. So what's the prescription that you would give the this Italian government or the next one, depending on what happens with the presidential election? Well, I think we, we, we need to work on the medium term in a further diversification of, 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 of supply, that's for sure. And uh, I don't think Italy can, uh, can do anything else than uh, uh, talk with the European allies and the transatlantic alliance on how to deal with these issues. It's not something which can be solved by one single country. This is something which has to be done within the, the, the alliances Italy has been in the last uh, 60 years. Um, Fabrizio, I've had a number of guests coming on and saying, like, look, it'd be not bad to have Mario Draghi as president because, it, you know, it's more than a ceremonial role. It's seven years. It focuses stability. I feel like they would be underestimating what it would take to form a new government that has enjoyed the stability that Mario Draghi as prime minister has had. Um, I think you're right in the sense that what is what is what it really matters for Italian economy and more generally also for, for, for financial markets is political stability and the continuity of the policy action which has been taken by the by the by the Draghi governments. Policy measures vis-a-vis -vis the pandemics in order to contain a pandemic, policy measures in adopting and implementing the next generation EU, the, the, the Italian plan of course, and also a number of reforms which are a, 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 the key to, to raise the, the, the baseline of the Italian of the Italian growth. So indeed it will be you know this is a this is a challenge at the same time, you know, I think um, whatever the position a uh, single personality have, what market will focus is indeed the continuity of the policies. Do, do you think the policies can continue or will different factions then try to look for elections and, and, and not be so supportive? I mean, can you go as far as saying that actually the success of Italy in accessing the EU funds will largely determine whether the EU fund rollout is a success overall? 
Absolutely. I think the Italy is the litmus test for the success of the of next generation EU for two reasons. First of all, it's the first beneficiary. Uh, it's around 200 billion and it's also the largest economy benefiting from, from, from that. Uh, Italy is the country which is, which is also, um, which has applied for the loans, not only for the grants, which is, makes a difference, for example, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Spain. And um, Italy is a country which needs more this uh, um, combination of reforms and investment. The next generation EU is not only investment, it's not only money to infrastructure uh, or project, it's also the need for reforms and reforms of the of the, you know the judicial system yeah. public administration um, everything in in italy we have a problem any time in which the public the public sector and private sectors have to work together yeah. there is a lot of friction there but e even if mario draghi stays prime minister i mean so far he's enjoyed the support of all the governments uh, the parties right the parties have got, gone large, largely behind him if they get prepared for elections in 2023 will be the will they be less supportive automatically of what he wants to achieve even if he stays a prime minister I, I don't know I think what they should do they should uh, um, uh, focus really on the implementation of the of the national plan this is the key for this year uh, this is the key for Italy is the key for Europe um, uh, you know after this year is really is really fundamental because the first year last year was the, the year in which the, the plan was presented in which a lot of formal steps were taken also in the implementation but you don't you know you need to go further than just adopt and implementing decree in order to really translate that into actions yeah. you know it in, now is when you know the pumps get you know get the road well, there you go so you, you have to deliver when that happens <laughs> exactly. Fabrizio, thank you so much so much thank for joining you. us. He is Fabrizio Pagani, Global Head of Economics and Market, Capital Market Strategy at Music, and he's a former Chief of Staff to the Italian Minister of Economy and Finance. We'll have plenty more from Rome, beautiful Rome. I have to say it is quite cold and there's a lot going on. We'll see whether that call between Vladimir Putin and Italian Chief Executives goes ahead. We're just speaking with Fabrizio Pagani about the relationship of trade. I think trade has increased some 20% of what Italy has sold to Russia, including pasta, which is why the Barilla Chief Executive is meant to be on that call. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on the relationship with Russia, the personal sanctions that the U.S. is now threatening on Vladimir Putin over Ukraine. We'll get the latest next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome to talk about, of course, the presidential election, but also Ukraine and how Italy and the rest of the West could deal with, of course, the Russian president. Now, the U.S. president, Mr. Biden, says he would consider personally sanction the Russian president if Russia moves ahead with an invasion of Ukraine. That's a big deal. We've never seen that before from heads of state. Now, Biden added that he has no intention of deploying U.S. troops to Ukraine, and the German chancellor, Olaf Scholz, and French President Emmanuel Macron pledged not to give up dialogue with Russia last night. Meanwhile, Russia continues to deny plans to invade Ukraine. So for a full roundup of everything we've heard and what's more to come, with us to discuss the latest on the tensions is our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's in Berlin. Maria, first of all, what was the outcome of the Schultz-Macron meeting on Russia? And is it, you know, a deliberate attempt from Vladimir Putin to destabilize the West by putting all of these factions? And is it working? Well, Francine, you know, that meeting that we saw yesterday between uh, the French president and Olaf Scholz, I would say had two aspects to it. One, of course, is that they really wanted to present a united front. You know, for a week now, Europe is coming under pressure that it is essentially all over the place when it comes to Russia, that there isn't a single voice on the subject. Yesterday, both the French and the Germans said, in fact, we're very aligned and we're together in our approach that we want to do this a diplomatic way, but if that's not possible, then we'll go for big sanctions. But the reality is, on the paper and, and in terms of the impact that this would have, we still don't know what the sanctions would entail. And as we reported yesterday in Bloomberg uh, News, the Germans are said to be considering accepting perhaps or exemptions on the energy related issues and companies. So in terms of the picture that they wanted to portray, that's one thing. But the reality is still very cloudy and very confusing, I would argue. 
Yeah, it is very cloudy. It's very confusing. But actually, well, I mean, if you're in Germany, you're much more dependent, of course, on Russian gas than some of the rest of Europe. And it, that is something which will mean that Europe will have a lot of difficulty in speaking and singing from the same hymn voice. Indeed, and Francine, we've seen it, the economic damage from Germany. We look at the past experience also, too, when Crimea was illegally annexed by uh, Russia. It's Germany that's going to take the big hit. We know it's going to do it on the economics. We know where it's going to do it on the gas. But I would also point to another thing that to me really caught my eye yesterday. When you look at this from the German perspective and the German perception, it's interesting to see that the Germans actually feel that they are the grown-up in the room. They say we need to keep that diplomatic channel with Russia. We know that as a country, don't want to be military aggressive and again to some extent and this may be controversial but it's this cultural factor and perhaps even the war guilt that they still carry which makes them believe that the best way to go about things is not on the military aggressive front yeah all right we'll keep a very very close eye on it i mean this is something that really matters to the markets and we're seeing a repricing of some of the commodities as well maria Tadeo there in berlin for us now a lot of the focus is also on the fed an interesting fomc it's uh, the second day it's finishing so the focus is exactly on what we'll see from the fed will they announce a further or the amount by which they will increase rates that's probably one of the most interesting things that we could see and if you look at u.s futures they're all gaining coming up woke chief executives and stakeholder capital how business can be more inclusive. This is Bloomberg. Fed Day stocks climb ahead of today's meeting, while Jay Powell will almost certainly signal a March hike. The question, how big? Raising the stakes. Well, President Biden weighs personal sanctions against Vladimir Putin if Russia invades Ukraine. Germany speaks an exemption on energy, seeks an exemption on energy. Plus, eyes on Italy. The second day of voting gives no winner in the presidential election as Italian business leaders are set to speak with Russian President Vladimir Putin. I'm live in Rome this hour. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Rome. Now, the focus firmly on the presidential election, but also we try and figure out these ties between Italy, Germany, and Russia with this ongoing controversial meeting between Italian executives and Vladimir Putin on a conference hall conference call set to go ahead. Now, the markets, interesting, never dull, especially in the last couple of days, especially ahead of FOMC. Here's our Danny Berger with all the latest moves. Danny, what are you seeing? Francine, it is a very bullish day, maybe even surprisingly so, because as you say, we're waiting for the Fed. And typically when you have people waiting for the Fed, they don't want to put on any big bets. Even so, we're seeing the best day here in Europe, at least on track for it in more than a month, up 1.8 percent. Volumes are also higher than average. We're seeing the cyclical type stocks like leisure, um, airlines, those things outperforming today, energy, materials. Also a strong day for tech, specifically the NASDAQ 100 futures up 1.7 percent earnings might partially be behind that which i'll get into in a moment we're also seeing some dollar strength today versus the euro euro down one tenth of one percent again if the fed's going to be more hawkish perhaps it is the strong dollar which will finally play through something that's been struggling to really solidify its rally in recent months and finally we're looking at a gain of just under one basis point when it comes to 10-year yields now when it comes to the earnings picture i want to look at what's moving pre-market we had texas instruments and and Microsoft earnings yesterday. Later today, we get Tesla. All of them performing very strongly, up more than 3% across the board. Texas Instruments up nearly 5%. It is a crucial period for tech. They really need to crush expectations in order to perform well because, yes, they've fallen, but it's been a small correction. There's still about 27% premium to the S&P 500 PE multiples. You can see that in some of the nervousness in Microsoft when it initially sold off at the market open. Executive then went on to reassure about the cloud. However, there does seem to be a little bit of hope after we saw yesterday's aggressive selling in the NASDAQ that the earnings picture can help turn it around, Francine. 
Danny, thank you so much. Full eyes, of course, on a lot of these markets. Sir Danny Berger in London. Now, BlackRock chief executive Larry Fink's call that stakeholder capitalism isn't woke and Unilever's recent investor backlash has re-sparked the debate around a company's place in the world. Well, business leaders are really increasingly speaking out on issues from climate change to politics, but not always to the approval of shareholders. Well, McKinsey's senior partner, Dame Vivian Hunt, argues that the pandemic has highlighted the interconnectedness of business and society economies, societies, and of course the environment are more closely linked to each other now than 50 years ago. So let's get straight to Dame Vivian Hunt joining us now. Thank you so much, Vivian. When you look at a lot of what's been talked about with stakeholder capitalism and the idea that we can still have profit to do good, do we need to redefine exactly what we're talking about so it doesn't become too wishy-washy and, and chief executives don't, you know, talk the talk but then don't follow up in actions? Hello, Francine. I, you make a very important point about translating the hope that you have an integrated view of what's best for your shareholders and fiduciary stakeholders with all of your stakeholders, but you have to be able to build it into a concrete business and operating plan. We can start with definitions. Stakeholder capitalism is not in opposition to any other kind of capitalism. It is a more holistic and broader definition of capitalism. Profit and high performance are at the center for any company and economy, but it also considers and defines in really quantifiable and holistic terms value for other stakeholders in the business system like your supply chain and your employees. So getting a definition that works and is business led is absolutely the right starting place. Vivian, how difficult is it actually to change supply chains? And if we bring it back to some of the geopolitics that we're living through today, Europe doesn't really have a comprehensive energy strategy that works, which is why we're so dependent on Russia. And, and you know, given all the geopolitical mess, that could be really at the, you know, the, the front of what we need to deal with in the next couple of days. I mean, is that the kind of thing that we should have thought about ahead? And do, you know, would stakeholder capitalism have helped in that regard? We are at a moment of transition. I think what you can see as we live with the second, um, really third year of the pandemic impacts, many business leaders have met, begun to manage the uh, crisis response and, and immediate high priority public health and employee response. Now we see two big trends as the biggest impacts from the pandemic as we manage businesses day to day. First is the impact on employees. And secondly, as you mentioned, supply chains. and. Now we see disruptions in the supply chains. It's probably more material than crisis response as we saw last um, winter and, and last year. So how do you think about the supply chain disruptions, whether that be from employee absences, product stockouts, and implications across your global supply chain, or simply transparency? Am I getting the data and information we need to manage it? The point on inflation is an important one because it is the first time we're seeing a structural inflation coming in across supply chains as broadly in many, many years. And many managers have not had to um, uh, deal with the degree and breadth of inflation that we'll see across global supply chains. So we see that as one of the most important areas for people to respond to. At the front line, where people pick up their products and services, but things simply as stock out and the likelihood that they might change brands, change retailers, change platforms as a result of not being able to get mm -hmm. access to products, employee impacts, and uh, making sure that you're able to attract the right employees and manage but some of the vacancies and retention we've had, and of course, inflation and uh, input costs, um, which are uh, critical for any business. So, Vivian. I mean, what do chief executives misunderstand about their supply chains and what do markets and us actually misunderstand about supply chains? Because what you're talking about is a supply chain disruption because of people being off work because of COVID. I mean, sometimes it's also about geopolitics. So, you know, if we bring them more domestically, if we have a more insular economy, is it necessarily better in, in dealing with your supply chains? It will, of course, vary by industry and, and structure. There's no question that being able to Man measure and manage the operational resilience of your supply chain and its impact on your environment, employees, and um, communities is an important element for businesses. 
it has to be done in a rigorous and quantitative way. So if you're still just managing inventory supplies and costs, for example, those are important, but you have to also look at things like the environmental impact, the social impact, as well as the uh, impact on communities. And so the notion of local jobs, a local supply chain that might add more uh, resiliency and reliability, reduce handovers, reduce connections, that could add resiliency. But for another business, it might be about technology enablement. There's no question that managing the labor mismatch and the operational delivery is one big issue, but it's also about integrating technology and the very powerful AI we have available to make better real-time decisions in your supply chain that could transform it. It's just important to remember to link other information to the criteria in addition to supply and costs. It has to also mm -hmm. include things like waste, right. environmental impact, and, um, and the other impacts that your supply chain can have. It's no question, Francine, more yeah. difficult than it was before the pandemic. Yeah, it is, you know, it is more difficult longer term, it's better, maybe, you know, increased costs in the short term. Vivian, thanks so much. Vivian Hunt there, senior partner at McKinsey and Co. joining us this morning on this very important topic. Now, coming up, we go back to geopolitics. Don't miss our conversation with the Germany Green MEP, Reinhard Butikofer. We'll talk Russia, Ukraine, gas, and of course, sanctions against the Russian president. This is Bloomberg. gaining, U.S. futures gaining, economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Roma, Italy. But Danny, we have a hot headline. Nasdaq futures actually gaining some 2%. All eyes on the Fed. And this is the time we're expecting them to talk about tightening this year. Exactly. It almost feels like stocks at this moment are disconnected from the events of today, i.e. the Fed, because we of course, don't know what they're going to say. We expect them to signal a hike in March, but we don't know much beyond that how hawkish they will be. So often this is the time that you don't want to place any big bets. Now, we are somewhat below that 2%, 1.97%, so not too far below. But all of the action is in equity markets. You're seeing European, U.S. stock futures all do very strongly, but other risk assets like oil, this isn't even up 1%. Bonds not doing anything either. Yields are slightly higher, but less than 1%. So again, all the action is taking place in stocks. Is this about the Fed? Well, we have seen a lot of positioning flushed out. We have seen some underweighting. So perhaps this is a chance with earnings season underway to buy equities, Francine. Yeah, an exceptional important day because of FOMC after the volatile yeah. week that we've had. Danny, as always, great work. Danny Berger there in London with some great charts that were some great assets looking at. Well, let's... I, can't find my words because I'm not caffeinated enough, Danny. Great charts that we need to look at. Let's focus now also on UK, UK politics. Boris Johnson will face more questions in Parliament today about alleged parties at Downing Street, of course, held during lockdown as police are now investigating the potential breaches. Now, to let's get more on UK politics with our Lizzie Burden. First of all, Lizzie, good morning. So Boris Johnson's future really hangs in the balance. But are we expecting the Sue Gray report to come out before the Metropolitan Police is investigating? And I Actually, if the Prime Minister broke the law, he can't survive this, can he? <laughs> well, that is the question. So now he has these two concurrent investigations. You've got the Metropolitan Police invest criminal investigation and this inquiry by Sue Gray. Uh, and he that could be published before the police report. And Boris Johnson has said that he'll make a statement to the House of Commons and answer questions when it comes. It doesn't look like that's going to come before Prime Minister's questions at noon uh, because Downing Street says it didn't receive the report overnight. But it leaves four questions. Did he breach coronavirus? rules? Did he break the law? His spokesman says he didn't. Did he mislead Parliament? And that's usually a resigning matter. And if he doesn't resign, can he get away with it? But the question then is, uh, will, his, will 54 of his Conservative MPs uh, vote, write to the chairman of the 1922 committee of Tory backbenchers calling for him to resign. Um, bear in mind, while all of this is going on, you've got a cost of living crisis mounting and tensions flaring in Ukraine. Uh, so the paralysis this political crisis is causing is now what's frustrating some Conservative MPs. 
Yeah, I'm also trying to get the bottom of these. How many exactly parties were there, alleged parties were there? I can't remember. I think I've counted eight. But there might be more. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest on Partygate in the UK to see whether the Prime Minister can actually survive. Now, let's get back to geopolitics. Everything, of course, in the markets depends on FOMC, but also on what happens in Ukraine. Germany has pushed for an energy exemption if there's a move to block Russian banks from clearing US dollar transactions. Now, that's according to documents seen by Bloomberg. The US has spoken to major gas producers producers, including Qatar, about getting more shipments sent to Europe in case of a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine that would interrupt flows. Now, let's get more on the situation. Still with us, Bloomberg European correspondent Maria Tadeo, also joining us now, German Greens MEP, he's Reinhard Butekoffer. Mr. Butekoffer and, and Maria as well, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Mr. Butekoffer, what exactly is the right way, first of all, for Germany's and European allies to deal with Russia? I understand a lot is at stake because of energy, but is this also the time to show Vladimir Putin what the limit is? Thank you for having me. And clearly, this is the time for all European allies and for transatlantic allies to uh, clearly draw together and to provide uh, a united front vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Obviously, President Putin is playing a very dangerous high-risk game. And uh, in order to deter him from following through with the threats, that have been emanating from Moscow day by day, uh, we need to make clear to him, and we need all hands on board, all capitals on board, that this would come with very high risk, economic risk in particular, for the Russian Federation. So, Mr. Butikoffer, do you believe that the German government is playing a dangerous game, that they're not being hard enough, actually, on Russia because of the linkage with, you know, with the energy? Should they just get along with the U.S. and say, we will stop at nothing to deter Russia, including freezing Russia out of the SWIFT international payment system? There have been discussions in the German public um, by uh, political leaders, both from the government side and from the opposition. And some of the voices that I've heard, I didn't cherish that much. Uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to uh, uh, invest now into excluding possible measures uh, from consideration. We need to be willing to pay a price ourselves also. Clearly, if we would restrict possible sanctions to those that might possibly not have an impact on our own side too. Uh, I'm afraid that would not uh, effectively have a deterring nature. So, um, I, but I, on the other hand, what I see is that the government is coming together. Uh, yeah. the, the chancellor recently in his usually cautious remarks has made it clear that he is willing and that the government is willing to go all but, in if but, necessary. But Mr. Budikhofer, you say the German government is ready to go all in, but the reality is after Crimea, there were no sanctions on Nord Stream 1. You build the Nord Stream 2, it wasn't your government, but it's Germany. And right now, if you cancel the project and you continue to go for sanctions, it's the German taxpayer that's going to pay for this. So do you understand why a lot of your allies feel that Germany is actually not serious about this? Look, I'm not sure whether it makes a lot of sense to renegotiate Nord Stream 1 or to renegotiate the situation of 2014. Uh, still, I would uh, maintain that without the leadership of Chancellor Merkel, uh, there wouldn't have been uh, this European unity. I well recall traveling to Washington at the time, and all my American friends told me Germany is going to block the sanctions and, in effect, Germany was the leader and kept the unity together ever since. So uh, I think you should give Germany its due. And in the present situation, which is much more dangerous than anything we've seen over the last decades, I'm sure that Germany knows where we stand 
we are part of the alliance. But, Ms. but Mr. Budikoffer, you also know that the flip side is that a lot of people would also tell you in D.C. too that the situation that we're seeing as a result of the CDU policy and the appeasement of Vladimir Putin, and now it's, all of this is coming under boiling point. So I wonder, in this government in particular, who is in charge? Is it Annalena Burbach or is it the chancellery under Olive Schultz, who in some ways does seem to resemble a lot the CDU policy? Well, it may be a journalistic interest to uh, look for divisions in the government. It's a political interest to not have divisions. And if you clearly analyze, if you carefully analyze what the chancellor has said and what the foreign minister has said, you will see that they are on the same boat. All right, Mr. Butikoffer, thank you so much. I don't definitely think it's, uh, you know, that journalists want divisions. We just highlight them if uh, certain divisions were to arise. Uh, Germany's uh, Green MEP there, Reinhard Butikoffer, and of course, we'll have plenty more on Ukraine throughout the day. Now, coming up, we're live here in Rome, once again, fully caffeinated, fully hydrated, because we have a busy, busy day. Uh, there's the presidential election going on. We understand that there's still no consensus cabinet coming up. There will be another vote today. Draghi remains the favorite, no consensus candidate but then we also look at the relationship between Italy and of course Vladimir Putin this is Bloomberg Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome. The focus here, of course, is on the presidential election, whether Mario Draghi stays as prime minister or not. So far, Italian lawmakers have failed in another round of voting to elect a president. The other question, of course, is what happens between Russia and Italy. There was this very controversial virtual meeting expected between Vladimir Putin and a number of chief executives of Italian companies. The government intervening, saying, guys, please don't meet with Vladimir Putin. So let's get straight to uh, the man of the hour who's been working nonstop to try and cover the election, also uh, figure out what's happening with this Russian call. He's Alessandro Speciale, and he's our Rome bureau chief. Alessandro, I mean, a number of things, of course, going on here. And the focus is really on this video call between Vladimir Putin and, uh, you know, Italian chief executives. The Italian government said, guys, this is not a good idea right now. Is it really going ahead? Yeah, it is going ahead. It had been organized for a long time, and uh, Russia and Italy have strong economic ties, of course. But the Italian government told any SNAM state-owned companies not to participate. One state company that will go ahead is Enel. The CEO, Starace, will be there. The CEO of Unicredit, Andrea Orchel, will be there. And, well, we'll try to figure out what they're actually saying and what Putin will tell them. Yeah, and this really goes at the heart of the problem, which is if you have a lot of energy ties or, you know, commercial ties, it's very difficult to then take, you know, a, a, a stance on geopolitics. Talk to me about the presidential election here. So we still don't have a candidate. Is Mario Draghi still the front runner? Uh, slightly less than yesterday, I would say. I mean, there have been reports in the Italian media that Draghi started meeting with parties on Monday because, of course, if he becomes president, there is a void at the government. Who's going to lead the government? Are you going to have a full reshuffle, a new government, new ministers? And the fact that Draghi started talking to parties led to the impression that he was talking about this and this was perceived as a bit strange. So, for now, the situation is a bit stalled. There is a lot of talk about the head of the, Sen the Senate, Maria Elisabetta Casellati. But we'll see. Tomorrow will still be a known event. Uh, today will still be a known event. Uh, white ballots, empty ballots. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow, lower threshold, just 50% of the votes, and that's when something may, might start to happen. I mean, I love this. So there's so much haggling right in the background. This is like a souk where people say, "Okay, I give you this, you get the presidency." There is like some of the uh, conversations must be really intense in the corridors. You don't want to know how these I things do. are made, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, like sausage. I mean, I do want to know actually. I don't know if anyone would tell me, but I'm here to find out. Our Rome bureau chief, there, Alessandro Spicci. Now, it is a big day for markets. We, of course, look at FOMC also coming up. But more on the Nasdaq and all of the market moves. Bloomberg surveillance early edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Our Anna Edwards is in London. This is Bloomberg.
I know the narrative is really gloom and doom right now, but we got to step back. From the Fed's perspective, I think the Fed is behind the curve. They want to engineer a soft landing. No central bank would want to engineer a hard landing. What we're seeing is a, a pretty good opportunity, we think, to get more aggressive and, and play the economy for now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, January 26. Our top stories today. Waiting for the Fed. Policymakers are expected to signal today that they'll start raising interest rates in March. Microsoft bounces back. Shares rebound on the outlook for cloud growth. Tesla is the next big technology company to report. And President Biden raises the stakes. He warns that Vladimir Putin could be personally sanctioned if Russia attacks Ukraine. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, quite a decent bounce in equities here in Europe for a Fed day. But of course, there's a backstory to that. Yeah, it's been a really, really volatile couple days of trading for equity markets globally, Anna. And I would say while you're seeing the bounce back in Europe and in U.S. equity futures, it wasn't really fully there in Asia overnight. It really was a mixed session when it came to Asia Pacific equities. You did have the MSCI Asia Pacific Index down by about a tenth of one percent. Japan was a really big laggard, but you saw some outperformance coming out of China. The CSI 300 actually ending the day about seven tenths of a percent higher as Chinese state media are telling investors to really hold their own here, even in the face of all the market at turmoil we we've seen those state media outlets really talking about easier policy in China trying to shore up the equity market that came very close to a bear market in the Tuesday session and speaking of Chinese assets I did want to point to the Chinese Yuan stronger against the dollar for a six day in a row right now it's 632.49 stronger by about a tenth of a percent at its strongest going all the way back to April of 2018 and then finally in the bond market you are seeing some selling pressure Matt including in New Zealand where the 10 year yield moved higher by more than four basis points ahead of some government auctions tomorrow, Matt. All right, so we'll be paying close attention um, to really three main threads today, Kaylee. Uh, you've got to watch what's going on in tech. After Microsoft earnings yesterday, it looked like initially disappointed the market. Now they're up in the pre-market. We're going to hear more about that from Danny Berger in just a moment. And of course, as Anna said, Tesla is coming out later. Massive, massive stocks, and they have the ability to move markets. Then you've got the Fed decision. I'm looking at the two-year because the front end of the curve is obviously moving more than you see uh, in threes, fives, tens, etc. And right now we're back up above 1% here. How hawkish is the Fed? Are they perhaps, as Tom McKenzie asked earlier, a little bit more dovish than maybe the market expected? And that's why we have a, a, a bit of a lift. And then the geopolitical tensions are driving energy prices higher. I've got Brent here because it's the global benchmark, up to $89 a barrel. Of course, NYMEX is up as well, and natural gas um, is up strong today. So we'll be watching those three threads, tech, the Fed and the geopolitical issues. Bitcoin, by the way, up 2.8%. It's really been a risk sentiment sign lately, and it looks like risk on. Anna? Yeah, absolutely. It does look risk on, and that's certainly how things look here in Europe. Those three threads that you mentioned, Matt, certainly having an impact on European markets. And usually on Fed Day, we wait and watch and uh, uh, keep powder dry, essentially. But today looks a little bit different. A rebound from some of the volatility that we've seen of late and some of the selling we've seen of late. Some of these markets in Europe up by more than 2%. What is driving us there? Travel and leisure is one of the stocks in focus. The sector's in focus, sorry, up by more than 4%. Some of the stocks in that sector up by 6 7 8% this morning. We spoke to Wizz Air, one low-cost airline in Europe earlier on, they were speaking quite bullishly about the prospects for just how normal the summer could be, which would be a treat for everybody. Uh, let's talk about something else that's been normalising just a little bit, and that's been natural gas prices. Not normal at all, but heading downwards at least. So we're down 2% on the, this is the benchmark European natural gas price. Remember, we peaked at around 180 euros per megawatt hour. That was back in December, so we're considerably weaker than that. We've got more gas flowing through that pipeline today than at any time since December more orders coming through that is the pipeline through Ukraine the pound 135 right now I put this in just to illustrate how we're not really seeing much impact from all of the political turmoil as the future of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom hangs uh, hangs in the balance uh, many people saying look that's not going to stick to equity markets or indeed to uh, to to uh, FX markets and others saying well where is the political risk is it if he stays or if he goes I put in Todd's on the corporate reporting side of things as well this is a, a luxury shoe manufacturer uh, amongst other things Things, and they reported earnings. Uh, another signal, Kaylee, that we're seeing positivity for the luxury sector through the earnings story. 
Yeah, earnings, of course, one thing we're having to pay attention to throughout the week and today, Anna. But of course, the day has only just begun. There is still a lot more on deck, including voting continuing in Italy to elect a president. It's set to resume today after a secret ballot yesterday failed to agree on a winner for the second day in a row. So we'll pay attention to potentially the fate of Mario Draghi. Then big tech earnings will continue after the bell today. Tesla will be reporting. And of course, the big event of the day is the rate decision we're all watching from the Federal Reserve. It is expected to signal its first interest rate hike since 2018. And let's get more on that decision now with Michael McKee, Bloomberg Chief Economics and Policy Correspondent. Mike, give us the rundown. Well, good morning, Kaylee. It is Fed Day, so party responsibly. I'm not sure, given what you guys are talking about in terms of watching the markets for a Fed reaction, that we're going to get all that much because we kind of know what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. They're not going to raise rates today. But here's inflation, the white line here, and it's at uh, 5.7%. That's the PCE index, the Fed's favorite. Here's where they want it to be. 2% and in kind of the range that the Fed would be in. Uh, and here's where the Fed funds rate is, at zero. So how many times does this have to go up to bring this down? That's the question. Probably not going to get a great answer today. The Fed is going to tell us that they're going to be flexible. We know they're going to raise rates, but they've got a lot of issues out there. On the inflation side, yeah, we've been talking about that, the highest inflation since 82, broader pressures, not just for prices, but for wages. Supply chain questions still around. And what happens if China has to lock down even more people? That could be a big problem, push prices up. But that could also mean that we have a hit to growth. There could always be a new variant. We've got Russia, Ukraine out there. What does that mean for the markets? What does that mean for the Fed? And fiscal tightening, not enough attention paid to this. We gave a lot of money to everybody in the last year. This year, we don't have that. So where does the Fed go from here? I'll see you at 2 o'clock New York time this afternoon. Yeah, definitely watching FCON go on the Bloomberg for um, the fiscal tightening effects. Michael McKee there talking to us about the Fed. Be sure to stay tuned to Bloomberg. Special coverage of the Fed decision and news conference. It starts actually at 1.30 p.m. New York time, 6.30 in London. Now let's look at how markets are positioning ahead of that meeting with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny? Matt, I really like how Bill O'Donnell over at Citi puts it that positions have been cleansed in this bond market ahead of the Fed decision. And for the first time in a while ahead of a decision, we have balanced and neutral positionings. Now, to catch everyone up, we've been extremely short in this bond market, but that has started to normalize. You can see it in JP Morgan client positioning that shorts have started to come off the table. You can see it in the appetite for auctions on short dated treasuries. Now, it's not just the bond market that seems to have shifted more neutral before for the decision. It's also the equity market. Deutsche Bank points out that for the first time since climbing out of the pandemic hole in November of 2020, positioning on equities is underweight. So the hope here is that without extreme positioning in equities or bonds, we'll have a somewhat logical response to the Fed, rather anything dictated by investors having to quick, quickly flip where they stand on these markets. That's interesting. So we go from short to cleansed in our positioning ahead of the Fed today. Also in focus, as well as the Fed, we have the tech earnings story then, Danny. We heard from Microsoft, you uh, 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 yesterday, didn't we? And that's already had a chance to be filtered into markets. We're waiting to hear from Tesla. Yeah, really fascinating reaction on the part of Microsoft. The initial reaction was to hit that sell button really, really hard post-market. But then it eventually climbed with some reassurance uh, from the corporates there saying that their cloud business is doing well. So Microsoft is a perfect example about how investors are really jittery around tech this earnings mm. season. I think friend of the show, Dan Ives of Webbush, puts it really well, saying we view this as the most important earnings season for the tech space in potentially the last decade as the street now needs to hear good news at a white knuckle time. So at least it was good news for Microsoft yesterday. It's climbing pre-market. So is Tesla uh, before their earnings. But considering the Fed put is much lower now, if not totally gone, it's back to basics for tech. It's all about fundamentals. And these earnings really need to crush expectations to help justify multiples, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. We're watching uh, very closely what happens to Tesla and, of course, still trying to figure out Microsoft with the cloud revenue coming down mm. a little in the fiscal second quarter. Uh, but forecasts are for strong cloud revenue in fiscal third. And that's what Dan Ives says people are watching closely. Danny Berger there talking to us uh, about the tech earnings. Let's get to the geopolitical now. President Biden has ramped up his efforts to deter Russia from war. He says he would consider personally sanctioning Vladimir Putin if the Russian leader orders an invasion 
invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Kremlin says sanctions on Putin would be politically destructive for the signal they send, but wouldn't have any economic impact on him. Emery Horton joins us out of Washington, D.C. to discuss. So, Emery, what do we know? Well, largely, Matt, this would be symbolic, right? And the U.S. rarely does level sanctions against heads of state. And the Kremlin quickly shot back, saying that that would be a breakdown on the political front. But you make a very valid point in the fact that even if this was just to be symbolic, it would be incredibly hard to sanction President Putin's assets because... People for years, journalists for years, I know some of them, have tried to find out exactly how much wealth President Putin has actually accumulated. Uh, what we know from the Kremlin, and you can look this up in public records on Kremlin.ru, he makes about 10 million rubles a year, owns a few cars in an apartment. 10 million rubles a year is 130 U.S. dollars. We <laughs> obviously know the president has a lot more wealth than that, and many analysts have said he could be the richest person in the world. The Pentagon Papers have tried to show this in the past, using those people around him like oligarchs and businessmen, but to directly pinpoint that wealth and the link to President Putin is very difficult. So these sanctions, if they were to be levied against the president, would largely been symbolic, but definitely would be a massive show of force from the United States. Okay, so if that is a little bit murky to figure out, Anne-Marie, let's talk about other <laughs> sanctions that could be put in place and how they could affect energy in particular. We spoke with Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs yesterday on uh, Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. Just take a listen to what he said the potential impact could actually look like. Our base case is no disruption. You know, it, it's very unlikely. If we think about um, about the sanction imposed disruption, I like to call it mutually assured destruction. It's not in the interest of any party um, to stop flows of energy through Ukraine or even into Western Europe. So he doesn't expect much disruption, Anne-Marie, and in fact, maybe there won't be because we understand from Bloomberg reporting overnight that Germany is seeking an energy exemption if financial sanctions on Russia were to be put into place. Is that something the U.S. would agree to? Well, the United States is struggling right now when it comes to the energy sector in Europe. They are trying their best to talk to other suppliers outside Europe. My reporting has showed they're talking to those in Qatar to try to make sure they can get liquefied natural gas to Europe to fill that hole if there was going to be a short-term disruption. Two things come to mind. One is that during the height of the Cold War, those flows, those energy flows continued. It is mutual disruption on both ends. Economically, President Vladimir Putin needs to continue those flows. But on the second point, if there was to be conflict in Ukraine, there is heightened risk that there could be disruption to flows, and not just because the Russians would want to use it as political leverage and energy as a weapon. Halima Cross have always said that President Putin never lets a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> But what if there is an impact or destruction on a pipeline? That could potentially cut off some flows to Europe. And we do know that a third of that gas right now, especially as we are waiting, or the Kremlin is waiting for Nord Stream 2 to get a check mark, a third flow through Ukraine. Okay, Amory, thanks very much. We'll wait to see how far Germany is prepared to go then on the sanctions story. Amory Hordern with the latest on that geopolitical story. Now, voting to elect a new president in Italy resumes today. That's after a secret ballot yesterday failed to agree on a winner for the second day in a row. Meanwhile, the Italian government has asked a group of top business leaders not to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Earlier, we heard from Paolo Scaroni, the vice president of Rothschild Investment Bank. Our houses, our hospitals, our electricity depends from the Russian gas a lot. Now, we have to understand that if you are not independent in terms of energy, you are not politically independent. This is what's happening in Europe. Let's get the latest from Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix, who joins us now from the beautiful rooftops of Rome. Francine, so we follow the presidential race in Italy and also the relationships between Italy and Russia. Tell us the latest. Yeah, so Anna, there's two big stories. Of course, uh, the presidential election and this, uh, you know, what's at stake is basically the stability that so far Italy has enjoyed in the last 11 months whilst Prime Minister Draghi was in charge because he could become president and it's quite murky. The process, I have to say, is not only murky but extremely complicated and secretive. So for the moment, we don't have a name and we'll have to see what happens. The other story, which is really the talk of the town, is Russian gas and the fact that the president, Vladimir Putin, is meeting virtually 
with about 10 to 15 Italian chief executives. This was planned in November, but it's going ahead in, in a couple of minutes. I think it should have started a couple of minutes ago. The Italian government is not happy about this, so it actually pulled out chief executives that are stained owed companies because they say it sends the wrong message. But it really goes to the trouble of basically how do you, you know, not hurt your economy, so have that Russian gas or even the Italians sell a lot of pasta uh, to Russia whilst at the same time keeping the fire on um, the president because of what it's doing with Ukraine. And Kaylee, should I move out of the shot so you, lo you look at how beautiful <laughs> it is? Because no one's really listening to what I say. They just want to see the Campidoglio behind me. Admittedly, Francine, that's what I'm looking at. But we do so appreciate your insight and for joining us from oh, that yeah. beautiful Rome, Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua. <laughs> and now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. One mover to the upside is DraftKings. Got upgraded to overweight at Morgan Stanley. $31 price target. That stock is trading around 2060 this morning, up about 6.6% before the bell. I'm sure a lot of sports bettors are gearing up for the NFL Conference Championships this weekend. Another mover to the upside, Texas Instruments. It reported after the bell yesterday, gave a really upbeat revenue forecast for the current period. Thanks to strong demand, that stock is up about 4.3%. Sinking to the downside, though, F5, the software company, it gave a weaker revenue forecast, also cut its growth outlook for the year. And as a result, that stock is down about 14% before the bell, Anna. Yeah, supply chain issues in focus there. Coming up on this program, more on the markets with Peter Chatwell, Mizuho International Head of Multi-Asset Strategy. How does positioning look ahead of the Fed? Is he pretty neutral? What kind of response to the Fed uh, is he expecting to see? And on that Fed decision, Rafaela Tenconi, ADA Economics Chief Economist, joins us. Plus, stay with Bloomberg for special coverage of the Fed's decision and the news conference. That starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. It's cold. Beware the rate hikes of March. You need top experts to break it down fast. There is no muscle memory for this kind of economy. The Fed's history is they break something when they raise rates too much. Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. We are now setting ourselves up for recession. This disproportionately affects your lower income household. It's not going to be an easy one. Bloomberg surveillance. The Fed decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. The fastest way to stay one step ahead. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines, Anna Edwards with us in London. We are watching um, a number of issues, but credit spreads, uh, especially as we head into the Fed decision today. And a lot of onlookers have pointed out that they remain very tight. Not uh, easy to say there's a lot of systemic risk in this market, even as the Fed prepares to take away uh, some stimulus. Now, I want to talk to Donna El Baltaji about this. She's Bloomberg's managing editor for credit in EMEA. And it's interesting because on the other hand, Donna, the last time we talked to you, we pointed out that corporate bonds have had their worst start to a year in decades. So what do we see in terms of the rates market here? Well, basically what we're seeing is that this market seems to be an oasis of calm where you've got other markets that are much more volatile. What I mean, these company bonds are basically saying that whatever is happening right now has already been priced in. Yeah, there was a slight move, but quite frankly, this has all been talked about at the end of last year. Everybody knew that company earnings were going to be in trouble. Everybody knew that central banks were going to talk about interest rate hikes. And everybody knew that inflation was going to hurt. So it, th this really isn't new. And yeah, but the lack of reaction that we're seeing there, Dana, good morning, it, both in, in, in Matt's chart in the United States and in your uh, your beat in the European region, the lack of reaction we're seeing in credit spreads, uh, spreads. Is there a risk that maybe credit markets are too relaxed about the tightening to come? Well, we did see an impact in the primary markets. What we saw yesterday, for instance, was that there were only four... Um, four uh, borrowers mm. that came with mandates and what that showed was that people were a little bit more afraid of how the primary market would react having said that the pricing hasn't really moved and that really what shows you whether or not people are in fact worried about this okay Donna thanks very much thanks for the insights Donna El Abasaji talking to us about credit markets here in Europe and beyond and for more market analysis check out MLIV go that is the blog from the markets live team on your terminal this is Moonback.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are watching the markets on this Fed decision day, and the markets are marching higher at the moment. The stock 600 in Europe has now extended its gains to 2%, sent for the biggest jump in seven weeks. You're also seeing futures in positive territory to the tune of almost 2% on NASDAQ 100 futures, Matt. The question is, can these gains hold given the volatility we have seen in the past few sessions, and especially ahead of that Fed decision at 2 p.m. Eastern? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with how markets react to Microsoft earnings mm -hmm. yesterday. They were a little bit all over the shop, as you would say, in England, um, down 5% at one point. Now they're up in the pre-market as we really watch or as investors watch the uh, cloud revenue very closely. But don't forget, it's such a huge company, more than $2 trillion. Plus, we have Tesla today. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to do with tech. It's not all about the Fed, although uh, they're obviously incredibly clo closely related yeah. and also a lot to do with geopolitical and energy prices. A lot to do with tech, and perhaps Europe doesn't tell that story entirely, but we are stronger in Europe, which is quite unusual for a Fed day. We'll talk about uh, the Fed day. Unusual to see such huge moves, but the context is important. 7% down on global stocks, of course, year to date. We'll talk to Peter Chatwell next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And here is what you need to know. Policymakers at the Federal Reserve are set to signal plans for their first interest rate increase since 2018. That rate hike isn't expected until March. They'll also discuss shrinking the Fed's balance sheet in the midst of the highest inflation in almost 40 years. Wall Street strategists say it's time to buy. Banks from Goldman Sachs to Citigroup see the global stock sell-off as an opportunity. The S&P 500 is down more than 9% since hitting a record high on January 3rd. And shares of Microsoft are higher after investors were encouraged by its forecast for cloud growth. Tesla is the next big tech company to report. CEO Elon Musk promises to give an updated product roadmap on today's earnings call after the bell. That is a look at what you need to know this morning. Matt, I know you'll be focused on the Tesla story. What else has caught your eye ahead of the U.S. session? Yeah, well, I'll be focused on, on really the whole tech sector because that's what's been driving the volatility that we've seen over the past few days, the historic volatility. Right now, we're looking at S&P futures that are up more than 1%. And as Kaylee was pointing out earlier, that's led by NASDAQ futures up about 2%. The U.S. 10-year yield up a little bit as investors let go of some of that debt. You know, as the Fed signals it's going to raise rates, maybe you don't want to be holding um, the stuff with lower coupons. New York crude is up with Brent. Right now, six tenths of 1%. 86.15 a barrel for NYMEX. Um, $89 a barrel for Brent, the global benchmark. And Bitcoin, which has really been positively correlated um, with tech stocks. I think 0.7% uh, has been the positive correlation, which is extremely strong with the NASDAQ 100. Right now, it's up 3.5%, $37,803. Kaylee, what are you looking at in the pre-market? Well, I am watching tech just like you, Matt. You do you have a number of movers, a lot of them earnings-related, including Texas Instruments, of course, operates in the chip space. It gave a really bullish revenue outlook forecast for the current quarter, thanks to the strong demand it is seeing. So that stock is up about 4% before the bell. Microsoft is also higher, and this was a really interesting story. Initially, even though it beat expectations, in its earnings report, it fell hard after uh, right after the results. But on the conference call, when they talked about a better growth outlook for that key cloud business, you saw the shares rebounding, and they are holding that gain right now up the better part of 4% in early hours. And of course, as Anna was speaking about and you were speaking about, Matt, we do have Tesla coming up after the bell today. Ahead of that print, the stock is up about 4% in pre-market trading, and Apple will report tomorrow, but it is taking part in that broader big tech rebound we are seeing take shape this morning. Right now, up 2.2% before the bell. We'll have to see if these gains can hold throughout the actual cash trading session, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of focus on technology stateside. Uh, focus on technology here in Europe, that Microsoft uh, report filtering through to some of the tech names here in Europe. Europe has, um, uh, well, the U.S. Has, has, of course, the tech slant. Europe has some tech names, but also has luxury. That's why I've got Todd's in here, up by 12.3%. It's a small luxury player, but continuing that theme of strong luxury goods companies' earnings through the reporting session. We just did that headline across the Bloomberg that we've seen the uh, Stocks Europe 600 extending gains to 2%, the biggest jump 
jump in some seven weeks. So that's the sense of risk on we have coming through on the European equity market space. And travel and leisure is certainly at the forefront of that. Some of the names in this sector up by more than 7% in today's session. Some positivity around what could be achieved in the summer on the travel and leisure side. Also adding to that risk on sense, we have a little bit of a retreat in some of the pickup we've seen recently in gas prices. This is the European gas benchmark just dropping a little as we see some of that gas flowing. Some of the orders being increased for gas flowing through that Ukrainian pipeline. The pound pretty unmoved by all the political tension recently that we have seen. And there has been plenty of political tension, many news headlines on that front, Matt, but not sticking to GBP right now, Matt. All right, now let's get over to Peter Chatwell, Mizuho's head of multi-asset strategy for a breakdown of what we can expect. Peter, walk us through the tick-tock of what you think we're going to hear today from the Fed, when we're going to start getting rate increases, what you think we'll see for this year, and what fiscal tightening is going to look like. Well, I think what we're going to hear is pretty much uh, no change from recent rhetoric. If you look at financial conditions, you know, with the equity move and the slight widening in credit markets, uh, it's nowhere near sufficient enough to really register on the Fed's monitor. So really what we're looking at is the Fed still being extremely concerned with inflation, the risk that inflation can de-anchor, and also the risk that inflation prints uh, may get worsened uh, if there are sanctions levied on, on Russia. So really it's about this conflict, um, which actually, potential conflict, which actually could make the inflation p picture worse for the Fed. Therefore, they need to be talking about a, a, a rise of at least 25 at the March meeting. Um, mm. Potentially, Peter, yes. I heard at least 25 there. Do you think there's a real chance they move 50? Actually moving, very, very low probability, but keeping the door open to it in case there is, you know, a, a, a big change on uh, in energy prices, for example. Uh, I think that that's what they're going to be doing, preserving optionality is going to be key for the Fed here. Well, and of course, Peter, the market pricing of the Federal Reserve's policy moves going forward already has come quite far. Is it even possible for the Fed to deliver a hawkish surprise today? Well, I think so. I think there is still room with regards both on the on the rate side, you know, um, opening the door to a, to a 50 at March, opening the door to more frequent uh, hikes going forward if needed. And that's what it's all about, if needed. It's about the tail risk that energy prices uh, rally from here, caused by geopolitics, caused by whatever factors. And that's what they need to be cognizant of. And this is the sort of Fed you're going to hear all of this quarter because inflation prints are still going to be above 5%. Even as they come a bit lower, still the, the Fed needs to be controlling expectations, but also the balance sheet reduction. Really, does the Fed need to be buying bonds at the moment? Don't think so. Do they need to be allowing the roll off? Yes, I would think so to try and rein things in. So there's room for a hawkish surprise on that front as well. Mm. OK, so this is about optionality and you say there is still room for a hawkish surprise. What about the tightening of financial conditions, even if it's only marginal, that we've already seen? Part of that, of course, coming through in that lower stocks environment, Peter. Is that going to be something that gives uh, the Fed pause for concern or, 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 or uh, an excuse for not being quite so hawkish as you suggest they could be? Yeah, uh, there's certain times when the Fed would be very sensitive to financial conditions. This isn't one of them because, we, you know, 7% inflation and a, an economy which is still performing well and inflation risks are still probably, in their minds, skewed to the upside. So this moderate degree of financial conditions tightening is probably welcome. Uh, and if anything, given that it's happening all from expectations, uh, it, it may even... Sit, suit them to continue uh, this tightening of rate expectations and, and balance sheet expectations to allow this tightening of financial to, uh, conditions to continue a bit further. When we think about where rates are and we think about the way that rates volatility sparked equity market volatility, Peter, and, uh, and we're waiting for the Fed then, we're waiting to hear what the Fed has to say today. What do you expect to see in tech stocks as a result of what the Fed says? Because, of course, we've got the earnings season underway, but we're also really waiting to see uh, the Fed's announcement. What is your expectation for tech from here? Well, there's two things to consider. Is there money on the sidelines ready to be put to work? Yes, there probably is. So there is room for uh, potentially all asset classes to have uh, a rally after the Fed, even if they come out hawkish. That's, that's the one thing. But I don't think it would be sustained. Uh, and the, real, the reason that it's very unlikely for it to be sustained is simply real rates are going up. 
and in a in a we're still in a negative real rate environment but the the change in those real rates is super important and that's going to change the mentality for the market here and also just think if the investor if the average investor thinks that equities now no longer have significant upside to them then what matters is the income side of the investment argument and that's the that's where tech is still uh, at risk of, of enduring uh, further correction or at least further underperformance here. Peter, uh, you run multi-asset strategy at Mitsuo. When you, when you talk with clients, what are they looking for? I mean, is it is it starting to uh, get to a point where they've made so much money in the last three years that they're concerned right now with preservation of capital? Or um, are they still expecting to be able to, uh, to grow their piles? Uh, the ones I speak to are still looking for, for upside um, to be able to grow. The defensive mindset hasn't really um, caught on yet. So that's where there is also further potential for that more defensive mindset uh, to become more entrenched. You know, we expect that that is going to be enforced uh, upon uh, some investors once uh, monetary conditions have actually tightened, you know, really uh, tighten once hikes have been delivered, once the balance sheet is reducing. So at the moment, it's just about anticipating that those expectations of of strong returns becomes a bit more moderate, and then the the investment strategies employed starts to become a mm. bit more defensive. And and we can see that going through. You can monitor that in various ways, like with, with uh, ETF flows. You can see that that defensive position is becoming really prevalent. But it's only at the start of this change. OK, so we'll look for more of that. Yeah, interesting it, that we haven't reached the peak in that defensive mindset then with the Nasdaq down 13.5% year to date. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Peter Chatwell, Mizuho Head of Multi-Asset Strategy. Coming up, we stick with our Fed conversation. Raffaella Tenconi, ADA Economics Chief Economist, joins us. What is the expectation at ADA around the Fed? We'll get to, her, the, to that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. Raimondo, that's at 10 a.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Employment is still well below the pre-pandemic trend, but everything else about the labor market says it's very tight. So it appears that the economy has less capacity than we thought. And so that's why we're in a situation where inflation you know, is, has not faded away quickly. That was the Nobel laureate and economics professor Paul Krugman speaking with Bloomberg uh, this week. Raffaella Tenconi, ADA economics founder and chief economist, joins us now. Raffaella, good morning to you. So we're heading towards the Fed meeting. I spoke to one guest from Bank of America earlier on who said it's hard to know what, uh, what hawkish and dovish messages from the Fed will look like this year. It's getting so complicated with interest rates in the mix and the runoff of the balance sheet. How do you think the tone of the Fed will develop through this year? Do you think they start uh, hawkish and carry on in that vein or become more hawkish as the year progresses? What's your expectation? Good morning to you. I think it's, uh, it's a more of a binary situation. Either they have decided that they will play prudent, in which case they will give more or less what the market expects, a signal that in March they will raise rates, continuation of, of a communication that the mixture of the balance sheet tapering and interest rates in any case will take care of the of the recovery. So it's, it's a fine tuning of inflation more than a very serious message that inflation is now the priority. And if it is a hawkish Fed, I think you're looking at a significant balance sheet uh, consolidation, so an actual reduction of the Fed balance sheet, and anywhere between five and six rate, high, rate hikes by next spring. So essentially conveying the message that if inflation is the priority, recession is what you're looking at next year. 
what what kind of picture do you see in in the in the European economy? I mean, how much does it differ in terms of the threat of inflation and central bank policy? European business cycle is slightly behind the U.S. one. The data that we have for January is very strong. I think you now see that the Green Deal and the digitalization package from the European Commission is really dominating and driving the recovery in construction and industrial policy right now. So I would say that for European standard, the recovery is very robust, although you can also see that consumers are very anxious about inflation. Inflation is going up, so that is similar to the U.S. However, I think the ECB is making its strategy very clear. It wants to wait and see. Inflation is not yet a priority. So you could let the Fed take charge, mm. see how far they go in slowing down global uh, global growth. Yeah. And the ECB has ample time by the summer to, to start signaling its adjustment. Well, Rafael, on that point of the Fed's ability to slow down growth, you talked about a potential recession next year. Do you think this Federal Reserve is going to be willing to hike into weakness? Yes, because that's what central banks tend to do all the time. It's just the business cycle has become so long that we tend to forget how it feels and how eventually it unfolds. If you look at the labor market, the labor market is not yet back at pre-COVID level, but it's very strong. I think you will see the best of the labor market within a few months. And then you'll begin to see the number of unemployed creeping up, but in its very slow process. So from the central bank's perspective, you will still be able to say that overall mm. the labor market is improving and inflation is really pressing. So central bank has to work within a fairly clear mandate. And if the mandate is inflation. Uh oh. Look, it looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with Rafaela's shot there, but I think this is definitely a very interesting uh, conversation, Anna, especially on the points about Europe as we continue to watch mm. geopolitics as well. Yeah, interesting call on the recession and the timing of that in the United States. Thanks to Rafaela Tenconi, if she can still hear us from ADA uh, Economics. Apologies for the breakup of that line. But interesting to get her thoughts on that uh, Yeah, recession forecast in the United States and the extent to which the Eurozone can afford to let the Fed take the lead here on tightening. Uh, with that in mind, remember to stay with Bloomberg for special coverage of the Fed decision and news conference. That starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Tom Keen joins us right now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance with the preview. You've got a long day ahead of you, Tom. Well, it's a long day, but it's going to be very exciting. And I might point out, Matt, it's going to be an historic day. There's all sorts of thinking. Our wonderful publishing this morning will feature Stephen Major of HSBC out of uh, Hong Kong with a really terse research note. Bill Dudley's scheduled to join us, and that'll be interesting because he says, let's go, let's go, let's get going. So what's the backdrop here? Matt, here's one of my most famous charts. This looks good on radio as well. And that is the Bank of Japan, where they had to say oops years ago. Now, in the middle of the chart is the financial crisis. That was a little bit everybody in the pool together. But the aloneness of the Bank of Japan is they disinflated off the boom of the 80s and the overleveraging. And they had a policy prescription to raise rates. And then they had to back down, as you can see with the red circle. And down we go to the long-term disinflation and deflation of Bank of Japan. And that's the remorse, that's the angst that's out there that confronts any central bank leader that goes, let's go, let's raise rates. Tom, what do you think, as we talk about one central bank leader, Jerome Powell, when he takes the podium for the press conference later, what is the toughest question he could face? Toughest question? He's gonna, well, it's going to be from Mike. Mike of has course. no last name. Uh, Bloomberg, Michelle Smith. It's McKee, M-C-K-E-E. -E. <laughs> but with that said, it's what he's not going to say. Uh, it's mm. very important that he find a theme, find a line, find a plot, and stick to it. And within some of these questions, not all of them, I'll, I'll be honest, some of the questions are really weak. 
But within the tough questions he's going to get from people like Michael McKee, he's going to have to really dance carefully. I would predict you're going to read, and Tom Purcelli mentioned this this morning, you're going to see him reading off all sorts of cards this time around. Okay, so you think the messaging, yeah, will be quite quite careful. Yeah, you, you mentioned the BOJ mistake makes me think here in Europe about uh, uh, other European Central Bank leaders that have come before and maybe where, where mistakes might have been made there and it's quickly reversed. I'm thinking of uh, Jean-Claude Trichet in years and years gone by. You've got every asset class covered, though, uh, Tom, when it comes to the programme, the Fed special. You've got uh, people to talk about rates, people to talk about uh, uh, the, the economy. You've got multi-strategists. Where's your focus going to be on that Fed well, my, special? The, my the focus on the Fed special is the linkage between balance sheet reduction or quantitative tightening, QT, and also the rate rises. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg has done some phenomenal work on this in the last 48 hours. The guess, really important, maybe bring them back up again if you can, uh, Brad, the idea here of Priya Misra, who said they will go slower. Uh, Diane Swank really worried about economic growth, and Jeff Rosenberg over at BlackRock, of course, looking at it, we're down down to a financial market. As Jeffrey, you said yesterday at BNY Mellon, it's all about the real rate moving higher. Don't forget JB. I'm going to be watching for Bianco. Yeah, he well, you know, he's only on to tell us what the Rams 49ers are going to do, but other than that, it'll be great. <laughs> All right, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, previewing the program to come, and there's a special, of course, this afternoon the Fed decides. Now look at what else we're watching. I am focused on cars. Surprise, surprise, today, every day. Um, I spoke with GM President Mark Royce yesterday. It was glorious. He gave me a timeline for when his company could end gasoline engine production. I think in the next 10 years, that can certainly happen. Uh, again, we, we, we are marching to battery chemistries that solve things like heavy-duty truck um, durability and uh, duty cycle, and we're doing that very rapidly. We aspire um, uh, and, and look forward to the, the day when we have zero ta tailpipe emissions, and, and that's the mission we're, we're on here right now. Now, I will miss the 6.2-liter V8 gasoline engine, but over his left shoulder there, you saw the new Silverado EV with 765 horsepower, does 0 to 60 in less than four and a half seconds. Um, it will be available to buy uh, next year. The Ford Lightning will be available to buy next year. You can also already buy the Rivian pickup truck, electric pickup truck this year. So, so many products in terms of electric pickup coming to market before Tesla's Cybertruck. Yeah. Tesla earnings coming out after the bell. Everyone's going to be watching to see when is the Cybertruck going to come out? Are they going to be able to make it at all? Was it just a joke um, or is it a real thing? And they're going to be watching to see, Dan Ives points out, the uh, production numbers. Can Tesla make and sell more than, I think, 1.38 million cars next year is the target. That is impressive. Um, there were a lot of people years ago who would have said that will never happen, more than yeah. a million cars. And now they're up there playing with the big dogs. I got to admit, Matt, I know you get so excited about cars, but it kind of goes in one ear and out the other for me because I live in New York City and I don't even drive a car. <laughs> I, however, will be watching not cars today, but the Federal Reserve decision at 2 p.m. What I'm really focused on is can it deliver a hawkish surprise in any sense, given how far market pricing has come, Anna. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out around 2 p.m. Eastern time and 2.30 when the chairman will begin his press conference. Yeah, absolutely. The focus for markets. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm slightly with you, Kaylee, there on the uh, on all the talk of trucks in particular. They just sound all too big for European roads. I'm focused on the UK politics. Boris Johnson will be facing Prime Minister's questions once again. Once again, we're asking questions about whether he can cling on to power, hang on to power with all the questions circulating around what happened and didn't happen at Number 10 Downing Street. The police investigating. Might we hear that civil servants report later on today? We'll have to wait and see. More Bloomberg surveillance ahead. This is Bloomberg.